Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of the No Heroes podcast. And I am uh, very, very excited. I know I say that every week, but I, <laughs> sometimes it's more true than others. And I am genuinely excited this week because I have as my guest, the great multi-talented uh, writer, producer, voice actor, Paul Rugg. Paul, thank you so much for doing this. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to talk to you about what you do. Oh, well, good. Yes, that might change after we talk about you might go, oh my gosh, we should really have thought about this a lot more than we did. But yes. Well, you might say I'm never doing another podcast sight unseen again. So it could go. Either, could go uh, well, you never know. You never know. Well, we'll, 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 we'll pray that it goes well okay. for on both <laughs> of our cool. end. Right, I have fun. full faith that your end will be entertaining. We'll see, we'll see right, how cool. I do. We'll see. So how did you, let's just jump right into it. Yeah. How did you get started in in voice acting, primarily, I think people will know you for your for your voice acting. You're excellent. I'm going to start buttering you up already. Your excellent voice acting work. Uh, it's probably what most people know Thank you for. I mean, good, some of the good, highlights. Good. Ex yes. Excellent is is the key word there. Just so we know. Yes. Just so we're yeah right. Um, we're going to make sure that we emphasize. Yeah, when, yeah, I, when, yeah. I, when I produce this, I will bump the volume up a little bit on the word. <laughs> okay, great. All right. So that it can't be missed. Uh, Good. So, you know, some some highlights, Freakazoid, of course, Animaniacs, Pinky in the Brain. Um, I mean, you have a list of credits longer than we can go through now. Uh, how did it start? Uh, I was actually doing – voiceover is not something I ever really thought about. Uh, I was doing sketch comedy in my – I had just gotten married, so I was like uh, 29. And uh, I joined an improv comedy sort of troupe improv slash sketch uh and we performed like friday and saturday nights and we rehearsed a lot and and we all had to pay to perform and it, you know it's the typical actor experience of um mm -hmm. if 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 you write it and perform it they will come um and uh if you think two people in the audience is success then that's what we did uh there were literally usually two people in in the audience but we were having a good time and um then we sort of gained some traction. And as they were just sort of developing Animaniacs, um, the, uh, the wife of our director of the, of the theater company said, hey, you know, they're looking for some kind of sketch comedy people for this new show they're developing called Animaniacs. So I met in, I went with them and met them and, and they gave me one script. This is before they had even started the show. They were just sort of hiring writers and they, they, they gave me a script and, um, and then based on that script, I was hired to be a writer. Um, and uh, so for a couple of years, because we we actually wrote that show a good two years, we just kept writing and it didn't really come out until two years af after that because it takes so long to animate anyway. Um, but during that time, sometimes they go, hey, can you do like a German? Because we're going to do Einstein. Can, do you think you could do that? Because we don't want to <laughs> we don't want to have the cast. And when I was like, yes, I can. And um, so I just started doing that. And then uh, there was a Jerry Lewis character I used to do around the office, like, you know, going, oh, 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 oh. and uh, <laughs> they, they were like, hey, if you if we give you a part uh, with that character, will you stop doing it around the office? And I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, I lied, of course, and I kept doing it around the office. But so that's basically how I how I got my start. And um, you know, I, I would go into those sessions and and if you sort of know the voice of a community that the, these were like and still are the top voiceover people. There's Frank Welker, who is Scooby-Doo, mm -hmm. who's Freddy on Scooby-Doo. I mean, he's he's done everything in the known world. So it was like, you really want me to go in there and sit next to them? I'm scared. So uh, but I did. And they were all very gracious people. Um and then when we were doing uh, Freakazoid, um, we kind of uh, we we were late delivering the show, um, and we had like nine months to write and and get a show on the air for the uh, kickoff of the Kids WB, and they didn't know. I was writing on it and we didn't know what to tell the auditioning, you know, actors coming in and we were just confusing them. And finally, our executive producer just said, Paul, why don't you go in there, lay a track down. And uh, then he secretly recorded that and played it for Steven Spielberg. And Steven said, just have Paul do it. We don't have time to think about this anymore. So, I mean, that was basically my start uh, in in that field, which is kind of weird because, um, like I said, it was never anything on my radar ever. Yeah, that's 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 quite a start. 
because um like i said people i'm assuming primarily know you for for your your voice acting work but but the writing credits on animaniacs to me is at least as impressive because oh, thank you i mean what a funny show i mean there's yeah. been nothing like you know and i'll tell you this animaniacs i credit animaniacs with turning me into a lifelong die hard marx brothers fan Oh wow, that's awesome! That's awesome because that's exactly that's exactly who they were. Um, right. I mean that 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 was our closest sort of in. Um, in fact, when I first met with them, they were like, you know, there's three characters, and I was like, oh, okay, I still don't understand. And then they said, Groucho, uh, Chico, and Harpo, and I was like, mm -hmm. got it. And I uh, I uh, I get that reference. Um, so yeah, oh, that's good because that's uh, that's exactly what we were doing. To this day, if people ask me, because I've done some, um, I did improv for a while. I wrote some sketch stuff. For in fact, I might be doing something again. Maybe we'll talk about that later. Um, and I, I I did stick my pinky toe into stand up at one point also, which is terrifying. Mm. Yes, but when people ask me, is. you know, like what what were your comic influences when you were growing up? I always say, you know. Marx Brothers and The Muppet Show. Mm -hmm. And there's like a perfect kind of, those two things kind of cross over somehow. I, I don't know how to explain it in something like Animaniacs. They're both very, uh, to put it, you know, they're both very old fashioned. I mean, The Muppet Show was an incredibly old fashioned idea. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's these, this ragtag group of, of, of misfits are gonna, are gonna put on a show and have some pretty big guest stars in it. Um, and and th there was also a, a simplicity and a joy, and they really didn't overthink it, and they were just having fun. And I think with Animaniacs, we certainly were not doing any modern sort of comedy. We were doing we were doing basically what I was raised on and what made me laugh and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And kind of you know proving that you didn't necessarily have to write something specifically for kids. Uh, for adults not to be able to sit in the room and go, okay, I, I guess I'll watch this this too, <laughs> which was which is sort of the Warner Brothers brand because if you look at the old Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, uh, that sort of thing, though those shorts, the original ones, eh, anyway, those are written for an adult audience. Um, in fact, if you went to see Casablanca, uh, there would have been a Bugs Bunny uh, short before that, um, right? Mm -hmm. And and so so I think so I think Warner Brothers emulated that sort of, uh, you know, we're going to make it safe. We're going to make it silly. We're not going to do anything that's not, not going to be safe for kids. But, but at the same token, uh, we're, we're also going to try to appeal to an adult mind as well. And when I say that, I don't mean not or anything. I just mean sort of, you know, keep it interesting. Um, right. And, uh, and, and, and uh, because someone, someone told me, when we were first talking about the Warner Brothers way, it's if you imagine a family, like a big Catholic family of seven people, right? And so the dad is there sitting one end and then you got the little baby at the over other end and, and everybody in between. And the idea was that something happened in the show that the dad would laugh at. And then the teenager might look at the dad and not understand why that was. And then the younger one would sort of look at the teenager and go, well, he's laughing at that. That's cool. And, and you'd have to discuss why, why is that joke funny? You know, or or why is that funny? And and right. that's sort of the yeah, th that's sort of yeah, th that's the way I love to write as well. You know, the thing that I the thing that I really love about the, I, I, and I think that you know over the years I found this out about myself that what appeals to me quite often when it comes to comedy is, and this is something that both the Marx Brothers had, that Animaniacs definitely had, the Muppet Show, something like early Conan O'Brien is it's. It's absolute anarchy, but it's smart. Yes. So it's not like nonsense, um, lowbrow slapstick stuff. It's, you know, it's tight and it's very well written, but it seems absolutely crazy and right, absurd. Yes. And it just tickles yeah. me. Like it just checks all the boxes. Um, so what, what were the things that, since you mentioned it, what were the things that growing up that struck you that were your influences as far as comedy was concerned? Well, so I was raised in Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> in, in the in the late '60s, '70s, early '80s, and um, so there was a fair amount of uh, like Jerry Lewis. Um, to my mind, I mean, you could I, I could pretty much watch him all day, 
and uh, you know, not the older sort of sarcastic, angry, you know, French the the, the Jerry Lewis that the French love, but the right. you know the the oh hi what oh okay I'll put it back in the box that back you know that and <laughs> when I was a kid I was like man this is this is gold Marx Brothers Abbott and Costello oh, yeah. um um yeah just uh, just all those sort of thing you know and I even remember being a kid watching Laugh In uh, which is way way back but uh, just you know um uh faulty towers in my teenage years uh the john sure. cleese faulty towers i i i i taught my daughter to be a faulty towers lover and now she taught her husband to be a faulty towers lover so um and monty python you know it's funny when when saturday night live came up i think i was 15 and i was like oh, it's fine it's fine but uh, my local station would always always play the uh, monty python right after and that I was like, oh no no, this is the stuff, um, because I just thought it was the craziest stuff I had ever seen. Yeah, and and it, it has that same kind of factor where it seems completely absurd, but obviously yeah. those guys were hyper intelligent. Yes, and writing some some things which were often very deep. Yes, even if it didn't appear so on the surface, but but at the same time, no no qualms about just being absolute clowns. Ministry yeah, of right. Silly Walks, right? Yes, it's just, yes. That's all that it is. There's, no, there's yeah. nothing deeper yeah, than yeah, Ministry yeah. of Silly Walks, but it's hilariously I, funny. Yeah. I taught, a, I taught a sketch comedy class at uh, John Paul the Great Catholic University in Escondido, which is a Catholic oh, wow. media art school. And okay. I, I, I showed them uh, the argument sketch, the Python, uh, and I think it's John Cleese and Michael Palin, and Michael yeah. Palin goes in to have an R argument. And, mm -hmm. um, and I was like, guys, this is pretty much the most brilliant sketch you will ever see. Uh, it, it's just, it's fascinating. And uh, they didn't quite agree with me because I think, I think really? just seeing, well, I, I think if you're not exposed to Python, you know, comedy is context. So if they did know Palin and they did know John Cleese, give it a couple of weeks. And, and I think they would be right in the, right in the pocket for it. But, but uh it's it's always accepting a comedy who the who who is speaking and i think sometimes especially with python you sort of have to get with that groove uh first yeah. that's that's really interesting you know I, I like what you just said comedy is context and and i don't think i've ever heard it put that way before but that's 100 percent true but i yeah. feel like you know and i guess it, i guess it depends on the person's personal sensibilities because i feel like so often python just transcends that like it's just strikingly funny but i guess maybe Maybe, yeah, it depends on um, maybe the age range, the, the points of reference. You know, because I was already watching, you know, the first time I saw Monty Python, so I was already watching, you know, Muppet Show, which is a good primer for right. uh, that kind of stuff. And, right. um, you know, and Animaniacs and, and all that. Um, what, was the, what was the idea when you were doing sketch and improv? So it sounds like you didn't love SNL because, I, I, you know, most of the time if I, if I talk to someone that was in comedy, the goal is, oh, I want to get on SNL. So was that ever a thought in your head, or you you were you were aiming somewhere uh, else? No, I mean, I, you know, I'm I tr trust me, you know, the Dan Aykroyd, John Belushi days. So that for me will always be S SNL because I'm a I'm a snob and I'm older, and that's what I was ra raised with. So you sort of, okay. you know, you sort of go into that Saturday Night Live, uh, you know, love with the people that you first met. Um, so for me, you know, the kill the killer bees, all those sort of classic classic sketches but for me uh i really liked improv um and i liked improv because you didn't need to really prepare anything and mm -hmm. uh <laughs> you know you could just show up uh and i loved i just loved uh sort of and I, you know it's funny i didn't know the rules the yes and you know never deny uh but right, i think yeah. that uh but i i sort of in i guess i instinctually knew them and um and I loved the desperation in your in in your partner's face, you know, when you're doing a two person scene, and and there's that there's that horror. And I think I love that I love that danger of like, what are we gonna do? Um, and and also, yeah. I th I think it helped make me a good writer for Animaniacs because. Um, you know, there's not a lot of downtime in improv. You kind of have to hit, you You better get to your, who are you, where are you, what are you doing? And you better start doing it. Um, 
And that's kind of how Animaniacs, you know, you, you, we only have generally six to seven minutes per short to, to get this out. So you got to hit the ground running. What was the percentage of improv versus tightly scripted stuff when it came to Animaniacs? I mean, were you guys playing around? Was there leeway no. or, or was what was on the page? That was it. Yeah, that was it. Um, okay. uh, yeah, there, there, you know, there would be, there would be some embellishment of a, of a, of a gasp or something, but um, we pretty much, because the writers would go also to the recording sessions and, um, and our executive producer would be there, Tom, Tom Ruger. And, um, you know, here's the, uh, here's an, here's how we wrote those shows. I mean, this is kind of tedious and boring, but I'll, I'll tell you anyway, when, when I was first hired to write, they go, okay. Uh, you know, I just thought, oh, we'll just put the, the words on, on a page and then someone else will figure it out. But that's not how we wrote Animaniacs. Each writer, uh, on that script would call angles like, Angle on Yako. Yako says his line. Pull back to reveal dot. Close on dot. Um, and so as we're writing the comedy, we're also writing everything the camera sees, where the camera is. And, um, and so what, what that did was it allowed me and all the writers to always be in control of the joke. And that means... Uh, Yako just said that, but I don't want you to see what's over there yet. Now, good, good. Now you can see what's over there. And, um, and that's kind of how we wrote it. So we wrote them very specifically and very tightly. Uh, so it didn't allow a lot of improv because it, it, we, we had a very set way that we wanted those to go. Um, and, and trust me, we really grew, we just worked those scripts over, uh, a lot, um, but then I did another show called Freakazoid, where I think literally the first two episodes were half improv, half writing. So that, but but that's because we didn't we didn't understand the character and we're just trying trying to find it. Then in our subsequent sort of um, ep episodes, it was a lot more sticking to stick, sticking to script. Um, yeah. So anyway, that's a very long winded way of me saying not really. Okay, I think I think it comes across um, that it's that it's tightly written, and as soon as you said that, even the the shots and the angles are in there. As soon as you said that, I said that yeah, it it, it makes sense that that was written that way. That those are those were actually in the scripts. But you did have, I mean, quite a few. I mean, so many people came through there and did did spots. So many so many actors. Had, now you don't have to name names, but. Did anyone come in at any point to do a part and just like just go completely off the reservation and want to improv and want to change this and want to change that? Did you did you have to deal with that at all from any uh, of these you know, stars no, that came in? No. Uh, would that be on Animaniacs? On, on Animaniacs, Animaniacs yeah. no. Yeah, no, 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 no. Um, because I think we pretty much made it clear because they would get the scripts ahead of time. And uh, mm. Andrea Romano, our voice director very well respected voice director she would pretty much make it clear that this is how it's going to be and also we did it in a way that's not done today uh which is we would do a rehearsal all the actors would be there they'd sit in sort of in a circle at their mic positions and andre would sit there with them and we would just start with the first scene and if they didn't understand context of a certain line we'd sort of explain a little bit um, and that way, that allowed us, having gone through the script once without even recording, that allowed us to then, uh, to them to feel the lines a little bit more for the, for the takes when we would start to roll. And generally, we would get a good page, page and a half. I mean, it was, it was very rare if we didn't get a good page in uh, b before there was a flub or something. But uh, yeah, that's that's. What, but there was hardly any, hardly any, um, anyone going off and being crazy. Well, that's good. Um, yeah. Okay. Being that I said that there was a, a, a literal who's who, if you go through the credits of the show, do you mind if I ask you about a couple people that the names jump out at me that, that yeah, are particularly... Sure. Uh, okay, so I have to start. Uh, this probably won't surprise you. It's, I think it was only one episode, but Phil Hartman. Yes. So... What was, yeah. Let, let, let me ask you first, before, before I proceed with these questions, because this will help me give them a little context. So when you guys are recording episodes, mm -hmm. is everyone doing their part alone? Are you ever, are you ever recording in groups for a scene or is somebody going in, banging out their part, then the next person, then you're cutting it together. 
Uh, generally, uh, I, I, I will tell you these days it's it's the latter. Um, right. The, these days you're going one at a time. You're only working with the director. You're not bouncing anything off of anybody. And it's horrible. It's terrible. Uh, it's a bad way to work. In those days, everyone came in. So everybody was there. Now, we, we had some actors. Uh, I think Bernadette Peters did all of her stuff from a studio in New York uh, live. Uh, so she was sort of se separate. Um, okay. And I think maybe a couple times we did... Uh, a, a remote recording, but generally, no, everybody was there. Always. Okay. Okay. And uh, so, and, and also Phil Hartman, you know, being a former a groundling, you know, I think he just, uh, uh, I think he just came in, did his stuff and, and, and everyone was like, Hey, that's great. And then he left and, you know, that's sort of how that went. Right. Okay. So he, he was kind of, cause I've, I've, you know, I've, I've heard on the more reserved side, in, in, in real life, but obviously knocking it out of the park with everything he did and, and um, what a tremendous loss for such a tremendous talent. Yeah. Um, you know, I was going to say, uh, <laughs> since you said about Bernadette Peters, like the one person you'd want to be in the room for, <laughs> you, know, right, yeah, before, yeah, yeah. you know, if I, you know, if I was, if I was around and I wasn't married, it would be, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe be Bernadette Peters. Right. Um, yeah. But also a tremendous comedic talent. I mean, the jerk mm -hmm. and, I mean, we could go on and on. Um, yeah. Okay, so you had the two two of the leads from the Simpsons do voices. What were what were those guys like uh, to work with? And and where I'm, I'm gonna I'm not gonna be able to grasp the, the timeline of it. Was this um, the Simpsons would have been rocking and rolling at that point, right? Yes, um, yes, uh, no. I be, yeah, it would have been. So Dan Castellaneta came in and did. I th was he the devil? I'm not I think sure so. who he was. Yeah. Uh, or no, he was Dracula. He was Dracula. Okay. In okay. Dra in Dracula, Dra Dracula. You know what? To be honest with you, um, I probably wasn't even there for that session. Um, you know, in the voiceover community, they just, they just come in, they, they, they work with the cast and then everyone says, all right, bye. I'm going to my next session. So I, I <laughs> yeah. don't, I don't, I don't remember too much about it. Uh, Freakazoid is where I remember more like specific, uh, uh, you know, like guest stars come coming in, but but in a Animaniacs, I just remember people coming in, being really pleasant. All right, let's get this done. And and uh, I remember I'd written a I'd written a, an Animaniacs called uh, oh shoot, what was it? It was uh, Sir Yaks a lot, and it was a kind of a Camelot parody weird thing I'd written. And so I purposely asked that Dave Thomas from Second City. Um, Right. Be cast at be cast as King Arthur because I remember him when I was in high school and it left such an effect of me doing a really bad Richard Harris impression uh, <laughs> from Camelot and I remember it the, the impression consisted of him being very soft and then being very loud and then going down <laughs> so I remember I wrote this whole script uh, with him in mind and I would write soft loud the soft loud and then he came in and he goes what's this soft loud thing mean and i go remember <laughs> remember when you did that thing in in second city and he was like no i don't oh, no. <laughs> and i was like <laughs> and i was like well uh okay so but it's funny because you know there, there are certain things that stick in your mind oh he's he must remember this because it left such a huge impact on me and he yeah. was like yeah no i don't remember i've done a million <laughs> things i have no idea what you're talking about and i so i had to literally go it's sort of like this, and then like that, and then like this. And he goes, "Oh yeah, okay, sure." You know what I mean? It was like I was kind of, I was kind of crushed that. Uh, I mean, he did it great, but I was like, "Oh, how come you don't remember the most important thing I've ever seen in my life?" So, yeah. <laughs> Do you know how important this was in my life? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. How dare you not remember? What was what was what was the writing process like there? So uh, there's two questions I really want to ask. Uh, yeah. First, how often are you writing for specific? actor do you have someone that you have someone in mind to do a part and then second was it like a writer's room kind of situation was no. everybody off on their own doing their own thing yeah no no we were all off on our our, our own thank heavens uh <laughs> i despise writer's rooms um okay yeah yeah no the way the way we would do it was um and again we're all sketch comedy people most of us in fact i think when i was doing it we all had shows in different theaters on friday and saturday nights and you know we were always doing our lines in the thing getting ready for the show and 
and writing and a maniacs. And um, so we all had our own offices. It was like an office building. All of the writers' offices were on the out, outside, you know, with the windows because we were the most depressed ones. And because uh, <laughs> writers are very strange, strange lot. And um, so we would go into executive producer and say, "Hey, I think I want the I want them to meet uh, Einstein." And he'd go, "Great, you have seven days." And okay, <laughs> bye, 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 bye. And you would go in your office and and you know start plugging away. And seven days may seem like a lot of time to write eleven pages, but no, but it <laughs> it wasn't. And but you know most of the time. We were in each other's offices, you know, screwing around, just like talking and stuff. And then we go, oh, I, I should go write something. But in that sort of wasting time, you know, your brain is always going, okay, what's this going to be? What's it going to be? What's it? How, how am I going to get into this sketch uh, to this short? So, um, and there was a lot of collaboration. You know, people would come in to, to my office and be like, what are you working on? I'd say this, you're going to be funny there. And it was this really <laughs> great camaraderie uh and then at the end of se seven days i was always the one who who made it nine and, <laughs> and i always got in trouble because i always always went always went over um and the executive producer would read it and say okay great uh i think maybe switch this up this 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 uh and of course that was an affront it was like you didn't love this so you know you'd spend another day doing the notes and going this is dumb, blah, blah. and then you'd look at it and go well this is actually better than it was okay fine and uh and then it would go right to Stephen. I mean that 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 was the that was the process. Stephen really? would, would read it, yeah. And then Stephen would read it, and uh, you always knew it had been a good day when you would get. We we had a, a stamp that they would put on it, and it would it was said final as per Spielberg. And if it was stamped with that, that was now uh, that was in gold. That was like that could not be altered. Um, yeah, I would think yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Cause I was, you know, I, I wonder how much he was involved. You know, when you, when you, when you think Steven Spielberg, you don't immediately think comedy, right? You think adventure, right, yes. you think high drama, well, right? Having but, seen 19, 1941, I can tell you that that's actually true. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah. so, you know, but at the same time, and now with you telling me this, in addition, he must have a phenomenal sense of humor. He does, um, and, you know, and he would he would read it, and a lot of times, uh, maybe say, "Hey, I don't think you guys really, uh, I don't think you mind this enough." Um, there was one, yeah, uh, I remember the couple, couple times he he go, "No, no, uh, do more, do more," um, uh, with this with this beat. Um, yeah, he read everything, which was a shock to me. I was like, "Wait a minute, he's really he's really." somewhere reading this stuff <laughs> and, uh, and <laughs> right. yeah he was and 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 this is when i think he was reading a lot of the stuff when he was in poland shooting schindler's list which is not the most upbeat uh, uh <laughs> happy movie around no so uh uh but i think he was probably in the mind to be like oh i need a break let me let me read some of these really stupid scripts and stuff um probably but yeah, yeah. and he was he was uh, you know, I have to say, I, I've I've met a lot of very, not a lot, but I've met my fair share of, of famous people, and and I think he is, you know, you want to go. He's doing exactly what he was probably put on this earth to do, which is to make movies and and do that so sort of thing. And I never sensed uh, like an ego or I'm this or I'm 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 that. He was, he was always super gracious, really nice to get to to uh, talk to. Uh, not that I ever went to his house or rode in his car or anything. I didn't. Uh, <laughs> but, but he. But I have met people that are like you know they make it known immediately that uh, you know there's a pe pecking order here. And he was just like he couldn't have been a nicer a nicer guy. Well, that's good. That's that's the kind of thing you like to hear. And you don't. Unfortunately, you don't hear that very often. But because yeah. um, he's certainly the kind of guy that could throw his weight around if he wanted to. I mean, that's if anyone has a name, it's you know right. everyone knows Spielberg. Yeah. Um, so when you're when you're writing these episodes, um, are you looking for a balance between how much is going to fly over the kids' heads and still be funny, how much is going to be purely for the younger audience, and how do you how do you kind of know when you've when you've reached that balance, or is it not a thought in your head? You're just writing for funny, and and it comes out, and and whoever gets it gets it. Uh, to be honest with you, maybe 
a couple of times I would go, geez, are kids really going to get that? Or I'm not sure. But uh, generally, I don't ever remember asking myself that question. Um, not that it wasn't asked down the food chain line. Uh, right. It very well could have been asked. But um, no, I never did. I never did. it. Uh, and if you can tell from some of our stuff, you kind of go, wait a minute, this is, uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know how kids are going to get this. But, uh, but yeah, so no, I don't ever remember a asking that ever, ever. And it was never forced upon me either. Uh, yeah. I have, I have since had jobs where it was like we were writing with specific group, you know, six to 12 or something. And that was not pleasant but uh yeah well these days it seems like you know we're in this odd time where either on the one end everything is offensive to people and on the other end they're showing and saying more on television than ever before but right. i remember you know in animaniacs everyone points to the prince joke as maybe being mm -hmm. <laughs> the one that kind of uh, snuck by i don't know if it did or or, or, or if there was no you problem know, but yeah, so so again, it's funny because that is often quoted to to us, and and I, I know people don't believe this, but we didn't. I mean, that was an, actually you you ask about ad libs. That was an ad lib from from Tress because originally the line was um, no 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 fingerprints, uh, and then Tress added the line because she was reading the script. She goes, ah, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> And, and we all went, oh, that's pretty funny. And we all laughed and we go, well, let's leave that in. Not, not because we were like, ooh, but we were like, yeah, it's pretty funny. And we left, left it in. And I, that specific bit, cause I've done some comic cons later and, and everyone was like, Hey, that, that Prince joke. And I was like, good guys, trust me. <laughs> we didn't, <laughs> we didn't mean to what, I don't know, but we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, we were just having some fun. Um, because we didn't caught it. The, the, the sensor didn't even catch it. So Right. Um, well, I was going to ask you about that, you know, because it seems like these days, you know, playing off of what I had, had just said, it's almost like sensors don't exist. But at that time, they certainly did. Was there stuff that you were told? Absolutely not. No. No. Okay. Uh, uh, guns were always problematic. Um, okay. uh uh, which is why mostly we always had, you know, mallets and hammers and, you know, uh, other forms of violence were totally su suitable. Um, <laughs> you know, big com comedy cannons, um, but no guns. And um, um, yeah, that was it. That was it. Uh, uh, smoking was kind of, uh, we couldn't do that. Like one day we were writing a parody of um, Masterpiece Theater and we had Yakko with a pipe. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they go, no, no, we can't do that. And so I think Tom Ruger said, well, can we have bubbles in it? Can bubbles be? Oh, yeah, that's fine. So we're like, OK, <laughs> we'll put bubbles in them. Um, but gen generally, no, it was pretty. Um, yeah, but but n nowadays, believe it or not, sensors are, are so much more there, but for different reasons. Uh, yeah, the, I believe the, it. And yeah, and yeah. Um, it's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy, but, um, yeah. Anyway, enough said there. Okay. Now I know that a, a reboot has happened, but do you think mm -hmm. that in, in its original form, Animaniacs could get made today? Um, that's a really tricky question because there are so many dynamics to the game now. Um, there are. Uh, I, I think so. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. Like the reboot, which I actually never saw, uh, they invited me to sort of write on it, but I was like, you know, and, but then when they talked to me about the note structure and how many executives would be there and then it would be, I was like, you know, guys, I did this and I had a lot of fun. I don't want to ruin that. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. so, but, but I think that, that these days Everything is so specific to an age group. Right. Uh, you are you you are the show that is the preschool show. You are the show that is for uh, boys uh, six to eleven. You are the show for girls two to four. Um, there is it's it's almost like specialization in college. Like 
there's no there's no liberal arts <laughs> idea to maybe cartoons, right? So it's like yeah. we're gonna we're gonna take a more holistic view to this, um, or a more wor- worldly view. Um, so you know, um, I don't know. I, I I I'd be interested to see how the new Tiny Toons uh, coming out will do, because um, I know they're they're rebooting that and that's coming out soon. So we'll see how that goes. You know, I, I, I didn't watch the Adam and X reboot either because I have a pretty strict no reboots policy, especially for things I really love. They scare me. Right. I'm so afraid yeah. that, you know, they just they just rebooted Justified, which I don't know if you're a Justified fan, but I no. loved it. it. I thought it was a great show. So I gave it a try, and it's just trashy. It's just the characters watered down. The writing is trashy. They're just trying to see what they can get away with. I turned it off immediately. Um, yeah. Especially being a Catholic too, like there's a limit for what I'll, you know, what I'll absorb. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like no, no. Mad. I mean, I hear you. I we're the same. You know, I'm the same yeah. way. My my wife and I we raised our daughter like like that. Uh, TV was not allowed, um, uh, basically. So you know, um, obviously we we fudged here here and there, but um, but yeah, we. I, same I'm thing. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. We, we, I was just gonna say, yeah. Same, same here. We, we. I have a two year old girl, and we don't. You know, we, we. So far, all we watched in the the two years since she's been since she was born is two Wallace and Gromit movies. <laughs> like that was, <laughs> that's all yeah, she's well, seen so far. Yeah. Well, I, I we raised my daughter on like um, uh, Laurel and Hardy and oh, all great. You know, yeah. All, all kinds of you know and harmless Disney movies like you know. The, the, the incredible journey home or the journey home what of all those you know talking dog movies and stuff but uh yeah but it was it was it was funny because um my daughter we were like you know we we're pretty strict about television then um and i remember she was in high school maybe she was in ninth grade or something and i went into a room to say good night and she quickly took the covers and put them down and i go well, what do you got there and i looked and there was a laptop and and <laughs> it's so funny <laughs> She, I was like, what are you watching? And she showed me and it was the old Dick Van Dyke show. And I was like, honey, <laughs> you may absolutely watch the Dick Van Dyke yeah. show all you want. Yep. I that's totally, great. that's absolutely fine. So yeah. That's great. That's what you want to find. Yeah. There's yeah. No, yeah. no problem yeah. with that. I but, have no problems here. Yeah. We watch a lot of like we, 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 my wife and I watch through all of leave it to beaver. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of black and white movies going on in our house and uh, yeah. a lot of Dan- Danny K and <laughs> like yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, I love it. it. It's, it's a tough time to, to raise kids, but luckily there is a dearth of a uh, good material out there. You just got to find. Yeah. And then, you know, reboots are, are a whole other thing, you know, cause one, it speaks to like, from the outsider perspective, the apparent um, just creative abyss that's happening. Um, in, in, in mainstream Hollywood, I would think right now, because everything's just a reboot. And at the same time, like I said, I'm so afraid that stuff gets ruined. Like, like whenever my wife or anyone else brings up these newer Indiana Jones movies, I just adamantly say that there are only three Indiana Jones movies. I do yeah. not acknowledge <laughs> <laughs> these other movies. Yeah. And every time, like the big one for me is every time that there's a hint of them rebooting Back to the Future, I have a meltdown because those are my favorite yeah. movies. Right. And I always used to swear like they're never going to do a reboot of Back to the Future. And I said, good, they better not. <laughs> but they keep hearing <laughs> hints and I'm like, oh, like I'm going to go crazy if they do. Yeah, it. I, I don't I don't think they're going, one of my best friends is uh, Tom Wilson, who's Biff in oh, Back you're to the Future. Is a, a very good Catholic man, by the way. I know that, yeah. And yeah. Um, and Tom and I have done a bunch of stuff together and given talks uh, uh, about Catholic creatives and stuff. But uh, Oh, that's great. But Tom, Tom, Tom swears there will not be uh, a reboot, so... You know, I hope you, he's don't right. wanna, yeah. you don't want to disagree with him because he's he's tall. So <laughs> he's a big guy. Yeah. yeah. No, my um, my wife goes crazy because she's heard me quote all of Biff's lines like countless mm-hmm. times. And then my my running gag with my wife is I'll just quote I'll just quote Biff out of nowhere, but then I have to follow <laughs> it up by saying, um, "Oh yeah, that's from that movie I've never seen. I heard it's good though. Like I I, I will not." <laughs> I will not break the facade that I've never seen the Back to the Future movies. Me with this posters <laughs> on the wall and like, <laughs> just to make my wife a little nuts. But um, 
So, so let's talk about Freakazoid a little bit. Um, yeah. Where, where, where did it come from? Let's let's just start <laughs> with that question right. well, because it's it's so wild and so yeah, it's kind of in line with Animaniacs, but at the same time, it's its own thing. So, how yeah. did that come about? So, um, Steven Spielberg wanted to do a uh, on our, our our company also did uh, Batman the Animated Series, which is right. a really brilliant show, amazing and. And uh, Stephen was like, you know, I'd love to do sort of a, a more comedic Batman, you know, still sort of a lot of stakes, big stakes and danger, but to have it to have a little bit of a sarcastic and silly undertone. So uh, Paul Dini and Bruce Tim, uh, who are uh, who did Batman, the animated series, sort of worked mm -hmm. on it. And uh, Stephen kept pushing it to be funnier and funnier because we had just done Animaniacs and he wanted it to be funny. And finally, Paul Dini and uh, and Bruce Tim were like, you know, this is uh, now we're getting into a realm that we don't really want to go into because uh, it's not our spe specialty. So the project was given to um, Tom Ruger, and uh, then Tom called me in his office, m myself and uh, co-producer John McCann, and said, "Guys, we're working on this show now." And I was like, "What is that?" And he says, "Superhero show." And I was like, "Nope." out of here. Don't want to do that. Uh, and he goes, well, we kind of have to. So, um, so really it, it was, we were given the character, we we're given the artwork, we were given everything and that was it. We didn't know anything. Um, so we just quickly had to sort of write this show and Tom Ruger, our executive producer sort of took first stab at these little collection of really silly, weird things, which mm. set the tone, which set the tone for the show. But it's basically a superhero show uh, written by people who don't necessarily like superhero shows. Um, <laughs> right. And, uh, and, and also, it was a lot of the stuff we learned from Animaniacs about being silly and about how, gosh, you know, that would have been fun to do on Animaniacs, but it wasn't the right time. It wasn't the right thing. And, and really, this was, this was a way to just, just have some fun. And uh, it's probably the most fun I had ever had working on a project. Uh, not that we didn't work hard, and certainly the scripts were really hard to do. But um, but we had an amazing cast of Ed Asner, Ricardo Montalban, um, uh, Tim Curry, uh, and yeah, Tim uh, Curry, and and every, every, everybody was just they were just ready to 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 just have some fun, and so. Uh, so we started getting a couple ep episodes in and, um, and then Steven was like, you know, guys, I love this. And we were like, well, okay, boom. Uh, let's just keep doing this then because he's happy. And, um, but we never quite, the network hated it. I think from the word go, because <laughs> oh, they no. just, they didn't understand it. And, and also to their credit and sort of our problem, uh, when you mentioned like the dem demographics, um, uh, young kids were just kind of like I don't, mm, I don't think so. Um, but then we we found out we were basically really popular on college campuses, um, <laughs> and we're like, okay, uh, but that's kind of the death knell for a Saturday morning car cartoon. If 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 you're not pulling in the the crowd uh, that you need, so you know when you talked earlier about you know making it acceptable to all all kids, I I think that. What we're really trying to do with Freakazoid is a little bit more Python, and um, and I, like I said, Python is context, and and it takes people time to sort of get on board. And I think uh, you know now these days, Freakazoid has a very good reputation, and you know, um, uh, but but back then we were not an incredibly popular show, but uh, we certainly had a, a huge amount of fun. Yeah, I I, I only hear. Very uh, lots of superlatives about Freakazoid. All good things when, whenever it's brought up these days. Um, in the moment, is kind of weird for stuff. You know, like our hindsight is kind of clouded. You know, I remember everybody in the world watching Animaniacs and Freakazoid, but were they really? You know, I don't know. Was it just my circle of friends? It might have been. Right, yeah. Um, but that's why they were my circle of friends, right? Right. Um, so when it came to the, the, the superhero aspects of that show, um, was Tom Ruger really the guiding force for that? You know, how, have you seen um, oh, what's the movie? Uh, Unbreakable. No. Okay, so in Unbreakable, it's it's an it's uh the conceit is like 
if superheroes were found in real life, basically. And this one character is a supervillain. His name is Mr. Glass. And his job is basically to explain to normies like how things work in comic books. So <laughs> he would be telling people, well, in the comic book, this is when the heroine and the villain have the main fight. So was was that kind of Tom Ruger's role on that show? Because as you were saying, you know, it, it, it wasn't like a bunch of superhero people in the room, but obviously Tom was with Batman the Animated Series and Mask of the Phantasm and even He-Man. Yeah. Um, um, was he kind of the go-to guy to, to, to kind of tell you guys, okay, no, this is this is how a superhero conceit works in this in this area. This is what a villain would do here. Uh, no, because I think we we all had seen enough superhero shows to know that you know it's Act One problem villain bad uh act two <laughs> villain uh the hero tries to figure out how to solve the problem act three fight right yeah. uh okay we we just decided that that act three would literally be uh, a page uh because <laughs> you know it was like um you know you 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 know that the hero is always going to win in the end so we decided to make our our big fights or our problems at the end, just kind of, we would kind of deconstruct them and have, have more fun with it. Right. Like I remember, I remember one I wrote, uh, the, the lobe who's one of our characters, David Warner, uh, was the actor and he's an amazing guy and uh, just a brilliant actor. And he, um, uh, he had invented this, this device turning people into clown zombies on the middle of a mountain. It was really dumb, but, uh, <laughs> but the very, the very end is Freakazoid defeats him by saying, you know, that's, that's kind of the stupidest idea I've ever heard in my life. And he goes, I know I was overtired. It was the best I could do. And then he walks away and it was just really dumb. Um, <laughs> and that kind of is how he wrote Freakazoid, which is, um, turning the whole conceit on its ear a bit and, and, and uh, it's just having doing weird parodies of stuff that, by the way, no one knows what the heck we were doing. Like there was a movie, uh, um, Johnny Depp in Ed Wood, which was uh, yeah. uh, a, Tim a Tim Burton film, a brilliant film. Amazing and, movie. And we were sort of watching that as, as we were uh, writing the first season. And so in the middle of some of our episodes, um, you know, Freakazoid says, pull the string. Uh, which is no one knows what that is. <laughs> I love but that. But it it made us really happy. So yeah. What a great reference that is. Yeah. I yeah. I think it's in the very first episode. Yeah, I it think, is dance right? dan dance of dance of doom. Yeah, that's right. It's so yeah. good. Um so let me ask you the same question I asked about Animaniacs. The writing process there, again, is it you're all going off on your own or yep. are you forced into a writing room this time? Yep. No, nope, no, nope. we're all on our own. Um kind of uh kind of struggling and it, it out and it was it was hard for figs it was a hard show to write at first uh yeah trying to f feel our way through um throwing everything and we could possibly think of um and then um and then we did pretty yeah so that's how it was we always wrote alone um gave our scripts to people to read and and for notes and stuff but uh there was there was rarely any of the of the, hey, let's all get in a room and talk about what this could be. Um, it was pretty much, I had a script and John had a script and Tom had a script and then I'd have a script and John have a script. And uh, we were always, always, always right. Are you getting together and, and doing read throughs? I mean, what I'm curious about is, um, you know, these are the days really pre-internet, essentially. Uh, if the yeah. young people listening can imagine such a thing. Yeah, <laughs> but, right. um, but but I, I promise you, there were days before the internet. So when you're, how are you getting feedback? Are you, um, cause it's not the kind of instant gratification or instant disappointment that the internet can bring you these days or streaming services and all that stuff. Um, are you getting together and doing read throughs? And is that kind of your first feedback is, is your co-writers and actors? Um, is it, is it ratings? Is it, um, you know, a review written in the newspaper again, if people can imagine. Such no, a thing. you know what it, it was, uh, uh, we would write them and then the next thing we would record them for the actors right um okay. it, when you're sitting in that booth um you know because there there's the voiceover there's the booth that all the actors are in and then normally there's the control room and you're sort of on a, a level above and you're sort of sitting looking down at them and when you start hearing the lines come together um you pretty much know oh this is this is working um or it's or it's not and you know you can do a real quick rewrite on the time um but but Jenna with freakazoid uh i and maybe this is wrong of us but i i think we were just like yeah this is fine this is good like this is 
I don't know an audience would have understood it, but the actors were really having a good, good time. Um, and you know, when Ed Asner is sort of doing his Cosgrove and, and he's giggling because the line is so dumb and, and you have to keep reminding Ed, Hey Ed, you know, just, uh, don't giggle. Cause the whole point of this is, <laughs> is for you to be down here like this. Um, so, you know, and then when Tim Curry came in and did, did his piece, you know, there's a certain joy in like having it all come together and like, oh man, this is, this is the stupidest thing I've ever been involved in. And it's, <laughs> and it's gloriously good. So, yeah. But yeah. I mean, you, you just, the names are dropping. These are absolute legends. And then, yeah. um, Ricardo Montalban, who you, who you mentioned yeah. also. Um, yeah. Ricardo was, Ricardo was, um, he was super, super sweet. Another Catholic, I might add. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, in fact, I think my wife had worked with him on, uh, he recorded the rosary once in Spanish and, oh, uh, wow. uh, but anyway, a super great, great guy. So the way he got involved in it is, um, I had sort of written it for, uh, for someone with a kind of a heavy Hispanic accent. I was thinking about him because I was thinking of Khan, uh, and we didn't think he was going to take it, but I guess he had this injury, his leg. He had some sort of leg injury that had plagued him his whole life after a, a movie stunt. And um, and and l later in his life, it really it was really beginning to, to hurt him. So I think he was under some doctor's care. The doctor was at his house when the script for Freakazoid came. And um, the way Ricardo tells it is the, the doctor uh, he, and, and Ricardo was like, I'm not going to do it. I would just have to go to the studio. I don't want to go to the studio. And the doctor said, uh, you know, Ricardo, I think you should just do it and get out of the studio. Get, I mean, get out of the house. So if it wasn't for that doctor, I don't know if he ever would have done our show. But he came and, and you know, Ricardo Mondo Bond enters and, you know, we're all like, oh, 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 Ricardo Mondo Bond's here. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and, of course, as the writer, I would be like, Ricardo, uh, so here's your character. And I remember doing that, going, Ricardo, here's here's what we're going to... And he goes, it's Khan from Star Trek. I know that, my friend. I understand the joke. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, okay. And he goes, I understand. Please, please, please. So he just did his Khan Ricardo thing. And he, he, he did the right amount of silly. I mean, and, and that's the other thing, too. You know, these actors would come in and they would do their job. They would act. And it was it was phenomenal to see see that and he was um he was just really fun and then one of the shows i wrote came up short uh it was called hero boy we came up about a minute short when it was all put together and the director called me and said we're a minute short you you wrote a, a script that was not long enough and i was like oh what are we gonna do and uh so i thought real quick well geez wouldn't it be funny uh, we had all this stock footage of warner brothers library all this old black and white footage so I said, well, I'm just going to write a, 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 like a blooper reel of Ricardo's character's favorite all-time bloopers, and he will narrate it. And uh, <laughs> so I put this together. We called Ricardo Bon in. He came. And again, I was like, Ricardo, so here's the deal. Your character, Gutierrez, really loves these really lame black and white bloopers. And he goes, I understand the joke, my friend. <laughs> yes, I understand. <laughs> and then he did it, and he nailed it. And it was, uh, yeah. So, it, yeah, it was I could go on and on about Ricardo. He was awesome. Oh, and I could, I, and I could, I could listen and listen. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan. And you know, he seems like, you know, someone that there's a lost quality, I think, in a lot of, in a lot of Hollywood stars that gravitas, that real yes. presence that someone has. And it seems yeah. to me like he's the kind of person that he comes in the room, like you were kind of saying, and you know, Ricardo Montalban is in the room. Yes. Um, and yeah. tremendous talent. And like you said, a, a good. I've, I've watched. I don't know how many interviews. He used to do interviews on. Um, world over raymond royal on ewtn yeah right he would be on there um and i would always watch because he, he's the kind of person too like the voice you just like whatever he's saying he could be reading a chinese restaurant menu yeah and, yeah, yeah and you're enthralled yeah. right yeah yeah um, he's awesome i have a i have um well, there's two questions i want to ask you i'll start with this one because yeah. I, I feel like maybe this this will be a little shorter but um yeah so because I brought up multiple times The Muppet Show and, and being very influenced by The Muppet Show, someone else that I know is was very influenced by The Muppet Show that I became a fan of when he was doing his talk show was Craig Ferguson. Mm -hmm. Do you have any particular recollections of Craig? And Because he wasn't Craig Ferguson then, right? He was, no, I guess, just no. a working actor or someone who was maybe kind of well-known in, in England, but certainly not on this side of the pond, right? Yeah, so I had originally written that part for Mike Myers. 
Okay. And because um, uh, I thought it would be funny if he did his Scottish a- accent thing. And then obviously Mike Myers wrote, uh, read it or, you know, was like, no, nah, I'm like, are you kidding? I'm <laughs> I'm not going to do that. So Andrea Armano was like, I was like, Andrea, it has to be Scottish because I've written all the cadence for Scottish. And so she called me in, she called John McCann and, and Tom Ruger and I and said, I want you to come meet this guy in my office. So we went and it was, it was, it was Craig. And uh, he read it and we're like, yep, that's it. That's, that's the, the guy. And I, you know, I could be wrong and I'm sure that someone will c- correct me, but I believe that was his first acting gig in the United States. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm, I'm pr- probably wrong, but, uh, but I believe it was. And he just came in and, you know, um, so he was just this guy from Scotland at that, at that point. Right. Yeah. Um, but did a, did a great job and went on to, yeah. like I said, that was, that was, I really enjoyed his show because of the, <laughs> the, again, it's that same kind of those boxes getting ticked, like chaos, yeah. absurdity, but small yep. Yep. and definitely the, you know, he, he, he literally did skits with puppets on that show because he loved the Muppet show so much. Right, right, right. Um, so from the, from another kind of technical question I'm curious about is, cause I've wondered this a lot about people that write for TV back when it was still TV network TV. Is that is that time limit that you're shooting for um, a, a hindrance, a constraint, or does it kind of force you to think outside the box? And for an analogy, like you know, I, I talk to people about um, you know the golden era of Hollywood, the Hayes Code days of Hollywood, and because right. I think a lot of people tend to think that like this was you know constraining and constricting on creative types, and they couldn't yeah. you know. But I said no, I think it forces you to kind of you know think think fourth dimensionally, as Doc Brown said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, right. um, and and to be more creative, I mean, I, I, I tell, but Citizen Kane was made under the code. Um, so is, is does the same kind of thing apply to when you're shirt, shooting for I don't know what it is before commercial, twenty four minutes, something like that. Um, do yeah. you find it? Do you find it kind of forces you to to think harder about um, tightening up the script, or do you find it to be uh, annoying at times? No, you know it. It's it's never annoying, but it is a puzzle. Like you're like, okay, here's what I know needs to happen. Uh, I'm on page 12 and I know, you know, with Freakazoid, I think the, the script lengths were anywhere from 28 to 32 pages. Um, and, uh, it was like, okay, so I can't, mom, I can't do that joke. I want to do, I can't follow that down. Cause I got to get to it. So what it, what it really forced you to do was edit, you know, it was like, now I only can go with my best stuff. Um, uh, and with, Animaniacs, it was even more brutal because it was like, I think 11 to, to 13 pages, 14 if you were lucky uh, for a tip, typical short. Um, so no, it, 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 it forced you, it forced me and everyone else that worked on it to, uh, to lead with the best stuff. You can't, you can't waste a bunch of time. That's why there's not a lot of breathing room in those, in those shorts. Um, and what was, what was it like coming from a lot of improv into that kind of tight, writing environment uh did, um, was that difficult to transition or or not so much no because i think in improv you are constantly gauging the audience constantly right so yeah. your 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 improv sketch is only working you can tell when a, when an audience during an improv scene is engaged they not, may not be laughing but you can tell oh they're with me here they're waiting for the for the next thing to happen or or uh but, but you can also tell when it's also dying and so what your mind does during that is, okay, we need to come up with the next thing that this scene is about, or, you know, beg the lighting guy to, to call blackout. Um, and so I think it was a really helpful thing, uh, that, uh, time is, time is valuable and, uh, there's not a lot of dead space in Im- improv and that, that certainly helped in, uh, Animaniacs. So Animaniacs and Freakazoid were certainly shows that broke a lot of rules and mm-hmm. bringing it back kind of full circle to improv again we talked a little bit about the improv rules i think anyone that has done any improv knows the rules what do you what do you think about those rules and what do you think about can they be can they be broken can they be played with or do they almost always result in the scene shutting down if you do or are, are there particular people maybe that can get away with it yeah no uh uh I also taught an improv class at, uh, at JP2. And, okay. um, and uh, I said, these are the rules. And, however, um, uh, you know, like all rules 
can be magic, can be wonderfully broken with amazing. But if you're just starting out, these are the good rules to stick to. But uh, yeah, they can be broken all the time. Because again, if we're going back to comedy as context, if the audience in an improv scene uh, is just delighting at the fact that you're denying constantly and the other actor has to deal with it and it's going hysterically well, that, then, it's, then it's great. So I think it's a case by case basis. Uh, I would say rules should be more considered a higher percentage choice mm -hmm. than a rule. Um, because I've seen every rule broken and, it, and it's, it's the bit that always killed the me memorable bit. Um, so yeah, uh, rules are there as more guideposts than rules. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, uh, you know, you get the odd person though, that shouldn't be break. Like I, I think of that, that episode of the office where Michael Scott's doing improv class and no <laughs> matter what the scene is, he ends up having a gun. <laughs> right, right, yeah, just, yeah, and everyone else just has to deal with the fact that oh, now nah, Michael has a gun, you know, in the yeah. in the toy store, whatever it was. Yeah, um, I, I did. Yeah, I, I did a show uh, for Henson and D Disney Plus called Ur Earth to Net, and the the it was about this huge alien that had a talk show, and I think one of the one of the things I was like kind of adamant about was I want him to, I want improv to be this alien's first love, but he's awful at it, um, <laughs> and and I had a great great time doing that so that's great um so we've we've touched on our catholic faith a few times yep. uh, over the course of the interview um how does that factor in is it a conscious thing when you're when you're reading a script or thinking about taking on a project does does it inform in some way what you will do what you will not oh, yeah. do have you have you turned things down because oh, you yeah. said this crosses a line that i'm not going oh, yeah. to cross oh yeah i mean a lot um yeah a lot in, in, in fact, when I was first starting out, or I would say the, the late 90s, early 2000s, when you would audition for a, when I would audition for a voiceover gig, uh, it would be like, here's the character, blah, 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 blah. Uh, now, when I audition uh, for something, it, there's a new line and it says anything offensive in the material. And sometimes it will, it will say, yes, um, you know, swearing, blah, 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 sexual content, whatever. And those are immediately, you know, I'm not doing that one. Um, right. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you so, I sort of evolve over that stuff, but, uh, but now I don't, I don't even touch it with a 10 foot pole. Um, Great. Because it's, it's just like, I remember I, I, I was doing a show uh, in Australia, it was, uh, it was called Pup It Up, uh, the Henson Company's Pup It Up, which is a very funny show. Um, and it's basically uh, all us puppeteers improvising, uh, doing an improv show with pu puppets. And there's 80 puppets, and it's really funny. Um, but sometimes the suggestions, as you know, from an improv audience, uh, it can go blue really fast. Oh, yeah. And, and, I've uh, done corporate and, gigs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so, but, but generally what you do in that case is, well, all right, uh, as long as all the other actors are on board with us steering it back to some sort of neutral position, mm -hmm. we're good. Uh, but as you probably want, well, no, once that genie is out of the bag in an improv scene, the audience smells blood and the, <laughs> That's right. and, and the actors, uh, you know, if you start panicking, you'll give them blood. And, um, you know, you'll give them exactly what they want. And then by that time, it just becomes, um, you know, they're like sharks and the blood's in the water and they want more and more and more. And so I, I had to bow out of doing any more of those because I remember like, wow, one show in particular that I was just like, oh man, this is, this is just the, uh, this is awful. And, uh, I went back to the hotel room and my daughter was still up. She goes, tell me a funny sketch you did, daddy. And I was like, nope, can't tell that one. Nope, I can't tell that one. Nope, not going to tell that one either. And I was like, nope, I don't want to do that anymore. So, um, yeah. Is it is it harder these days than when you first started? Because from the outside, it appears like, I mean, it absolutely appears like these things have accelerated. And the projects that, again, this is just, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, work in the industry and I haven't done um, comedy as a, as a job. I'm going to use the word job <laughs> for a while. Um, but it certainly appears that entertainment, that it, it, the, the, the downward spiral has accelerated where I don't see many projects 
that I would want to watch as a Catholic, let alone be involved in? Is it is it harder these days to find things to accept working on? Uh, yeah, I mean, it. I mean, just generally in general, it's it's hard to even find you know work, especially during a strike and everything. But 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 the yeah, it is. Um, the there is a general tone. I mean, basically the genie's out of the bag mm -hmm. and, and, uh, ev everything is, I mean, I would say 80% of the content, uh, is like, ah, I don't think that that's really good. Um, but it used to be 20 year years ago, there was, there wasn't that, like, it seemed to be like, yes, there was fringe, Kind of like, well, that's a little edgy, but but there was a general agreement by all parties concerned that we're not gonna do that, or mm. we're not gonna go there all the the time, or, or whatever. Um, but now I think everything is pushed there uh, for. I'll give you a good example. I had a pitch I did at at Netflix a while back, maybe it was about four years ago, and it was a, a silly show, just really kind of dumb and and. Uh, and they're like, we really like this, uh, but do you think you can edge it up a bit? And I was like, well, explain edge it up. And mm -hmm. and it's basically what we think it was. Um, yep. Yep. And I was like, yeah, no, I can't. And they go, well, you know, to be honest, our demographic is shown, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, great. Um, we're done. But uh, yeah, they, they, to be honest with you, they purposefully do this now. Uh, sure. because that's what their demographics, that's what their research has said, you know, shows, which is why um, I think it's, it's imperative for people to truly uh, think about, you know, when you watch it, trust me, uh, if you have Netflix or you have Disney plus or you have whatever, they know you're watching. And so you're not doing the culture a lot of good if, if, if you you know continue to show them that you'll support that stuff, the only way that the only way that we're ever going to get back to a balance, because I am not arguing that you can't have edgy stuff for a certain audience. It's a you know everybody can do what they want, but it would be great if there was some middle ground uh, for a, pl a place for people to go where they don't want to be preached to, they don't want to have you know sexual content, you know they don't want to hear a bunch of swear words, um, and. Uh, but but I think in in all things I think the pendulum is certainly way over here, but I think I think there's a chance for that pendulum to swing to swing back. Um, well, I'm interested in in your your opinion on one of the things that's been like a a, a through line for this show, and one of, one of the reasons I started this show is you know we were talking a little off air, and I said it's not a Catholic quote unquote Catholic podcast; it's a podcast. I like to say that happens to be hosted by a Catholic and what that means for me and what my mission was like, anybody can listen to it. Anybody can be right. a guest really, but anybody can listen to it. We're not going to swear. We're not going to say things that are offensive, you know, particularly to our faith. Right. And people can just have right. a good time, whether they're a guest or a listener. And, that, and that's what I want. And, it, and, and it, it fits in what you just said, like that middle ground that should exist. So what I'm, what I'm interested in, and I asked, I asked other people this before, but what do you think about this? what appears to me at this point to be an unfulfilled promise of um, independence that the internet was supposed to afford creators, right? Because what I see is the early days even of YouTube are gone. And now even that has become whatever brings the most clicks, the most money, sensationalism. So I, I, right. I saw at a certain point this idea that, okay, people that don't want to work within that system that's pushing things that are, um, you know, uh, antithetical to for example, uh, our Catholic faith. Well, there's another avenue. We don't need those people. We don't need big Hollywood. We don't need big music production. We have the internet. But I don't see that promise being fulfilled. I see the, that also being um, co-opted by the people pushing the same kind of ideas and agendas. Um, do you think that there's a way to write that course? Well, so if if you look at YouTube, right? So I, I'm I'm you know re regardless of the fact that YouTube you know does terrible things and, and stops people from saying certain things. If, if, if you were to put up a decent, clean, you know, uh, family and, and by the way, when I say family friendly, I don't mean like, ah, oh, hi everybody. You know, I, I don't, I, I just mean something that's, that's safe, that, that, that a kid could watch, 
but you know, isn't going to be sca- scandalized and stuff. But I don't right. necessarily mean purely children's entertainment. I just mean like the old days when we would talk about watching a TV show. You know, it's like we mm-hmm. we all understood what that what that meant. I think that um, that that YouTube is still a place for that to be done. Um, it's just that if you don't get people to you know watch it or whatever, then then that's just the way it is. But I think there is more opportunity. Uh, than there ever has been, ever, uh, ever in the dawn of Hollywood for anyone to get their product out out there. Uh, it's just, it's all about marketing and getting people to watch your thing and getting people to watch your show. But I'm still, you know, if we're not talking about news and sort of critical topics of uh, of medicine and all that stuff, uh, <laughs> th- then 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 YouTube probably isn't the place to go. But if you if you're a young creator out there, trying to put your stuff out and and trying to get your your start and and trying different things and trying comedy or editing things together and stuff i i still see youtube as a viable viable platform um for doing that um you know i did a stupid uh video with my dog uh my wife's chihuahua of him biting me and i'm petting him and saying this is how you relax and um (laughs) and i just i just put it out there and you know the thing garnered I mean, more views than Freakazoid ever had in its entire life. And, <laughs> and so, so uh, I still am bullish on the, on, the, on, the, on the ideas of a YouTube. Um, but then, you know, now that Twitter is going to creator content, you know, uh, you can put your stuff on Twitter. Right. Um, yeah. And you can, do, you can do anything. So I'm, I'm more bullish on the idea uh, of of still getting your stuff out out there what that means as far as views i couldn't tell you but it doesn't mean you're not creating and um so that's what i think about it it's um it's really encouraging i i agree with you i think that you know unfortunately for some of these young people there's been like this pavlovian conditioning when it comes to things like twitter and youtube that you know, the reward are, are the clicks and the views. Right. And so therefore I need to skew for whatever gets me those. And I think if you're going into it with that mindset, you're already done. But if yeah, you, are, you are done. Yeah. If you are sincerely trying to create that, that's gotta be your focus and the audience will come or it won't. Um, yeah. I'm, I mean, um, that, that, that's, that's what comes from having been on stage uh, for two people in an audience. Right. I mean, you yeah. just, you, you get out there and do it no matter what. And by the way, some of the best improvs I ever done, uh, I've ever done, are in front of two pe- people. You know, <laughs> and it was like, I mean, so it's like, it's not an excuse. It's it's just uh, if you want to make something, nothing is stopping you. That's very true. There's um, there's never been. There's a guy I interviewed called Doug Tenapel, and he created Earthworm Jim. Oh, sure. I know Doug very, very, okay. very, very well. Yeah. So he's like me. He's constantly banging the drum about this, that the opportunity is there. Like, get out and yeah. create. Why aren't you, you know, even if YouTube throttles you, well, let's say you get 100 views. That's 100 more people than would have seen your stuff 10 years ago drawing it in your basement. So, yeah. <laughs> so just and, do it. Absolutely, too. And, and you know, um, I follow Doug and and uh, and I watch Doug in Exile and all that stuff. But I think Doug also recently I think t- uh, tweeted an idea of uh, he hadn't created anything in a while. I, I don't mm-hmm. know why he had been working or what he's been doing other things. And just the the and he wrote and he sat down and just drew something, and and that and it filled his you know soul with oh, wow I was I was meant to do that I'm meant to to create. And, right. you know, I have, to, I have to remind myself a lot of that too, of, uh, you know, um, sometimes I need to just sit at the computer as painful as it is to write. Cause for me, writing is incredibly painful or can, can be, cause you want to put just the right sequence of words together to, in a certain way is to make it entertaining. And, um, and sometimes that's hard. Creation is hard. Um, I mean, it's all hard, but but the rewards are when you edit it all together, you go, yeah, I really like that, right? And you forget how hard it was. Um, and I just think people need to bear that in, in mind. And, um, you know, I think, yeah, I think uh, I really, I, I think you just, people got to get out there and, because and, when I was a kid, there was not that. We couldn't do that. 
Um, and now you can with all the editing programs and everything going on. It, it, anyone has a, a, a chance to put their stuff in front of billions of people. Yeah, it's, it's the opportunities there. And um, I just want more people of, 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 let's say, of goodwill to take advantage of it. Um, right. Yes. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and that would make me uh, incredibly happy. Um, but just maybe one or two months. I, I could keep you all day. This is maybe, Paul, this is maybe the most <laughs> fun I've had doing the show so far. And I hope you'll oh, come good, back good, on. Good. Oh, sure. Because um, we didn't even touch on puppetry and all this other stuff that I'm like very interested in. Oh, yeah, about. yeah. Pu pu um, puppetry is uh, was fun. I'm, I'm, it's, I find it really fast. I mean, again, won't surprise you. My, my love for the Muppets, so <laughs> it's there. Yeah. Um, but maybe, maybe we can focus a little more on that if you, if you come back on again. But yeah, I do sure. want to ask you about something. Um, again, this is this is this is a question um about having to do with Catholicism. Do you find that um, and people that listen to the show have heard me say this ten thousand times. So I love Tolkien. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons I love Tolkien is not just because of his masterful storytelling, but because right under the noses of everyone that thought they were just reading a really excellent fantasy book is a whole bunch of Catholicism, mm -hmm. like tons of it in there. And I find that that is a much better tool for getting these ideas across than what I see online, which is people just you know yelling about doctrine at each other all day. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. So that what, gets what, very what you... tiring. Oh yeah, it's 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 hard to look at. Um, what do you think about this idea of art and entertainment as a vehicle for subtly introducing these ideas or, or aspects of Catholic thought or faith in general, belief in God to people that maybe hadn't even considered in the first place? Is, do you think it's effective? And do you, do you think about that uh, at any time in, in, in any of your projects? Um, I don't. And I'll tell, I'll tell you why. I, uh, first of all, Tolkien was a genius, right? So yeah. it's like, unless it's done with the right, mm, just the right way, it can come off as awful. And mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Like it can come off as, oh my gosh, really? Uh, and, but that was Tolkien's gift. It was C.S. Lewis gift, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's, yeah. you know, I mean, if you read The Last Battle, uh, which is my favorite um, Narnia story, it's just pretty powerful stuff going on there. Um, just no doubt, no doubt about it. But, uh, but I, you know, I'm, I'm not a the theologian and I would never even, I'm not, you know, I, uh, I know the faith pretty well, but I would never presume to put it in a story for anyone. The best I can do is to do no damage yeah. and, uh, and to just do what I do. And, um, you know, never bring scandal to anyone or anything like that. So, so that's how I think I personally can contribute to it. There are those people that are brilliant at being able to sort of do an allegory to faith and all that stuff. Uh, <laughs> being a comedy writer, I think I would blow that phenomenally well uh, and not do a good job of that. So I, I see that as value, but I, I also see that as, um, I mean, that's kind of what, uh, that's kind of what your mom and dad and and your priest and and your 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 Catholic school and your homeschool or and your communities of faith and all that that's what all that does right um, yeah so, so I I'm not sure that it needs to be well no let me put it this way uh, I personally could never write that because it would be awful but I I can see a use use for it but um but I think entertainment is is exactly that word entertainment it's something we take in for 30 minutes <laughs> and then we go on with our lives and and if if we have been raised properly there are a lot of ifs here right in a perfect in a perfect <laughs> sure. world enter, entertainment is just a thing it's just a thing and then it's over and then i'm not going to try to change your mind i'm not going to try to do anything i don't care who you are here's a funny thing i wrote right yeah um that's sort of where i would like to uh, where i sort of like to be so that you know, when people find out about the, you know, they might go, hey, are you Catholic? Oh, yeah, yeah, I am. Oh, really? What's that about? That's weird, right? So, you know, <laughs> you can kind of talk about it or whatever. Um, and uh, where do you go to Mass? Oh, I go there. Oh, that's cool. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, it, maybe ev evangelizing in a different in a different way. Um, yes. Because I, yeah. well, I, 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 I kind of think, you know, that's what JP two meant by, you know, the new evangelization of is, is don't be afraid to live your Catholic faith. Just do it. Um, 
I think that's what he meant. I could be totally wrong. There are common well, people that, but I think that's what he was go going for. Well, I think, well, Paul, you know what? Um, joy and beauty and laughter are very important things. They're, they're, they're absolutely aspects of God, of the divine, right? And so just right. producing things that can, that contain or, or, or provoke those reactions and feelings in people without scandalizing them, which is, which is what you've been doing is, is tremendous. And it's a form of, of, um, evangelization in its own right. And I think right. we, we need, we need that tremendously these days. And I agree with you hundred percent. I think that it's a, a, a tricky thing to have to juggle and deal with. And most people probably shouldn't be att attempting it. <laughs> Yeah. But if they can, yeah. if they can bring a little bit of, of of joy and laughter to someone um, in a package that's not going to scandalize them out, out out the other side, then that's of tremendous value. Um, so I appreciate that you you continue to do that. You have been doing that. And again, like I said, I, I, I mean honestly, and I don't know if I should cut this out <laughs> from my other guests, but this is this has got to be the most fun I've had doing the show so far. Oh, great, and, good. Um, I'm just fascinated by so many aspects of what you do. And like I said, I'd love for you to come back on and talk about puppetry, talk about um, anything else, all these other topics, more about, you know, writing comedy because I'm fascinated about that. Yeah, um, sure. If you'd be willing, that would be, that would be great. Absolutely. Um, okay. So let me, let me not monopolize any more of your time today, although I could keep going. And uh, thank you again for coming on. This is tremendous. Is there, is there anything else that you would like the listeners to know that we didn't cover? Uh, no, um, no. No, no, I'm I'm good. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much again. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. I think people that that actually listen to this will have will have a great time listening, and hopefully, we'll do it again soon. Okay, awesome. <laughs>